The history of Overwatch is interesting. Once critically acclaimed and Game of the Year, with insane popularity to becoming the worst reviewed game on Steam, and its reputation forever tarnished. A lot has happened since the beginning, from big game changes, the most insane metas, controversies, and scandals. So today, we're gonna have to start from the beginning, when Zenyatta had big balls. I mean, like his projectile orbs were bigger. Yeah, I probably could have mentioned uh, Bastion's shield or something. Okay, let's go further back. Originally, Overwatch wasn't going to be Overwatch. It would be a MMO with FPS elements, originally titled Project Titan. Work began on Project Titan in 2007, which was eventually cancelled in 2013. The team that worked on Titan then took aspects from it and started developing Overwatch, which would be a player vs. player FPS with MOBA elements. The plan at the time was that Overwatch would be the foundation of the game, so later on they could add PvE, and then further down the line turn it into an MMO. The early footage of the Overwatch development looks quite different from the game today. The heroes and maps were still a work in progress. It had some pretty funny looking graphics and animations. For example, Winston used to run around on two legs, and uh, Bastion, um... Also, Genji was always using his Dragon Blade. Back then, I bet Torb still had his wall climb, which I refuse to believe he never had. You can't convince me, Blizzard. And one day in 2014, we got our very first look at the world of Overwatch through a cinematic trailer. Gamers were excited. This game looks like it's gonna have an insane story mode. What's that? The Overwatch beta? Wow, this game is feeling really promising. It was a 6v6 hero shooter where you can pick any character with no limits. You can even run a full team of the same character. Fun with all monkeys. I really like this Bastion character with his personal shield. This seems balanced. And as I mentioned prior, Zen does have pretty big balls. <laughs> Look how little the roster was compared to today. Wait, they accidentally put Symmetra in support. That was an accident, right? Right? So with your heroes, there were four classes. Tank, support, defense, and offense? Basically, they didn't understand that DPS heroes, as we call them, were good at attacking and defending. So those classes didn't really make any sense. And yeah, the game was pretty fun. I could see it getting pretty popular. Boom! New cinematic. This monkey guy is calling all heroes. <laughs> Wait, was that Sojourn? She's not supposed to be released for like six more years. Also, is that Echo, I think? Suddenly, Overwatch 1 was finally released, and Overwatch kept pumping out cinematics. You're one of those heroes, aren't you? Not anymore. There was a total of five for the release year of Overwatch, and they were mind-blowing. When it comes to animated cinematics for video games, Overwatch just did it best. I'll never forget when I saw the Dragon cinematic for the first time. It made me immediately fall in love with the lore of Overwatch, and I had to play this game. But seriously, try to go back and watch the Bastion cinematic and try not to cry. I fucking dare you. People from all genres of gaming came together. People who have never touched an FPS in their life came running to this game. Your grandmother was seething to try Hanzo for the first time and try out his scatter arrow. You know where I can find some ass. This incredible game became game of the year. You wouldn't believe the popularity this game once had. Despite the success, people started to realize Overwatch 1 had some balance issues. If you don't like Orisa or Mauga today, you wouldn't survive in Overwatch 1. The early metas weren't as bad, but they kept on getting worse and worse. In Overwatch 1 Season 1, this isn't exactly a meta, but it shows how strange competitive was back then when it first came out. Imagine both teams came to a draw. For example, you both pushed the payload all the way. Now, luckily, there's still a way to win. You just gotta hope that a coin flip lands in your favor. Yeah, a coin flip. Basically, the coin flip determined if you were allowed to attack again. So basically, only one team is allowed to win the current draw. Sounds fair. Luckily, they removed that in Season 2. However, there is another glaring problem. <laughs> Having the ability to have any number of the same hero was definitely not the most balanced thing. So they finally ended up removing it. One hero per person. After this, some small metas started showing up. None of which I would say were anywhere close to being as broken as the later ones, but it's still nostalgic to see them. Triple tank was pretty popular, and with the new hero Ana, her nano boost gave extra damage, reduced damage, and speed boost. That's right, nano used to give speed boost, which allowed for such things as the Beyblade meta, which was just nano in combination with Reaper's ultimate. 
Nanoblade was also pretty strong at this point, or just throwing this nano on your Rhine and your 3 tank comp. Diva was also becoming a thing a bit, as well as Pirate Ship. So on payload maps in Overwatch 1, people would use their shield tanks, at the time Rhine, to shield their Bastion riding the payload. The point was to protect your Bastion with your life, and he would just kill everything that comes close to the payload. There were also things in Overwatch called Cheese Comp, which meant playing annoying and easy characters like Torb and Symmetra. Back then, Symmetra had 6 turrets instead of 3, and an auto lock on her primary fire, so that no aim was required. Torb and Sim had so many changes in Overwatch 1, we'd be here all day talking about them. Symmetra, Floating Oval Shield, Shield Generator Ultimate, which weirdly enough, new characters still get voice lines talking about it. They got a Shield Generator, bloody cheats! Teleporter Ultimate, Torb Armor Packs, Level 3 Turret, yada yada, you get it. Then there was also Death Ball, essentially having a tanky comp with a Lucio speed boost, and things like Reaper and May. God, it miss Ryan and Zarya working together. After these smaller metas and team comps, here's when things got a little fishy. Metas started lasting a very, very long amount of time. Months? To seasons? To many seasons? Doesn't Maga meta sound fun if it lasted half a year to a year? Huh? Doesn't that sound fun? Consider yourself lucky. The Moth meta. So, Blizzard decided to rework Mercy, something that happens somewhat often for her. Originally, with Mercy's ultimate, you can mass resurrect your entire team. So, the strategy for that was to wait for the enemy to come in, use all of their ultimates, kill your entire team while you were hiding, and then you would swoop in and res the entire team. It was very, very sad if you were on the enemy team after using all of your ults. So, the change to Mercy was her ult and to put resurrect on an ability cooldown instead. With her new ultimate, Valkyrie, it would allow her to fly freely and have unlimited ammo on her pistol. It would also make her healing and damage boost stronger and affect multiple targets at once. And, okay, we're not done yet. It reset the cooldown for Resurrect. What? That sounds a little too much, right? Yes. They had to repeatedly nerf Mercy many, many, many times for her to finally not be meta. So unfortunately, in these dark times, if you did not have a Mercy on your team, you would absolutely lose. There was no chance. The amount of reds as possible was insane, as well as just how strong Valkyrie was. During these days, people would check the profiles of everyone on their team, because there were no private profiles yet, and bully the person with the highest playtime on Mercy to switch to her. And since there was no roll queue, you would queue for a game, everyone would only pick DPS, and you'd have to sit there and wait to see, okay, who's actually gonna switch. Sometimes they didn't. So if you wanted to win, a lot of the time you had to play Mercy, even if you did not want to play her. I was one of those victims. Somewhere around this time, the Overwatch League was born. The Blizzard CEO, Bobby, wanted Overwatch League to be like the NFL, but a global esport, which is kind of a weird model for a, you know, video game competition. And since so many people loved Overwatch at the time, it actually went pretty well to start. Though, unfortunately, the higher-ups kept making worse and worse decisions for the Overwatch League, which would lead it into the ground as we know, but we'll get into that later. The next meta stirring up the competitive ladder was the Grav Dragon meta. Honestly, I don't see this one being as bad as the Mercy meta, though I could see it getting pretty annoying with Hanzo and Zarya's alts being used so frequently. The reason this suddenly became meta was people realized you could damage boost Hanzo's ultimate, which would kill even through Zen's transcendence, which should have been the only counter to it besides Lucio's ultimate. Though this meta finally ended when Hanzo's dragon was no longer boostable in an upcoming patch. Then, about time, the defense and offense roles were finally combined because they didn't really make any sense. And the Overwatch team realized that they had more DPS heroes than any other role, so they primarily focused on releasing tanks and supports from now on. The next big meta was Double Sniper. It consisted of Hanzo and Widowmaker. You can imagine why this would have been not fun, being, you know, one shot constantly. Though another problem brewing up was that with more and more characters being released to the game, there was also more crowd control and stuns, which goes along with the next meta. Brace yourself, this may be the most painful and PTSD causing point of Overwatch for some people. Please cover your kids' ears for this. Goats. The release of Brigitte and what follows. Brigitte had to be the strongest hero added to Overwatch on release ever. She completely broke the game. She was a support that can practically duel any other character in the game. What wins, Brigitte or a large German man and his hammer? Literally, Brig would win this fight. It's I don't think it was possible for Ryan to win this fight. Keep this in mind. If it's like overtime, you know, <laughs> <laughs> against Grimhawk, 
<laughs> she also had a very extremely easy combo that would one-shot Tracer. You just shield bash Tracer, left click her, and whip her, and she's dead. And she's stunned the entire time, so she can't recall, she can't blink out of there, she's just dead. So you could have imagined how this would have killed Dive. There was nothing in Dive that could do anything to Brigitte, nor any type of comp to be honest. You kind of just need a Brig of your own. Brigitte herself probably needed an insane number of nerfs for the devs to finally get her to be balanced. But way before that could happen, an Overwatch team named Goats created a team comp consisting of three tanks and three supports, with Brigitte in there as a support. DPS heroes were no longer viable at all. So Brigitte released March 20th, 2018, and Roll Queue was finally released in September 2019. So meaning Brigitte broke the game for 154 days. 154. I mean, sure, you could blame Goats for ruining the game before they finally introduced Roll Queue, but she was definitely the catalyst. So many people had quit the game during this time, and some players started using the famous phrase, Overwatch is dead, as well as a lot of people naming their accounts, Delete Brig, and the hatred for her was rampant. And the hatred for Goats even bled into the Overwatch leak. Imagine having to watch three tanks and three supports go at it with virtually the same team comp. People wanted change. People wanted to see DPS heroes being used as well, as well as missing playing them themselves. If you don't believe me that the fans hated Goats for how long it lasted, check out this Overwatch League clip. The crowd gets so excited to see Houston Outlaws not playing Goats. Some of the things that Outlaws fans were waiting for is a good Tracer player. Until they switch back to Goats and the crowd did not like that. Combos worked well for them before, but as soon as they see the defensive setup, they will just simply swap it away. Crucial time lost here for the Outlaws. Then, finally, Roll Queue was put in place, locking two players per roll. And soon after, the birth of a new meta that is arguably just as bad as Goats, Double Shield. So what made Double Shield so good was that Arissa and Sigma's shields could be used when the others was down, making the team virtually always shielded. Arissa and Sigma were also pretty good with their shields because they could also shoot through them and from a distance, unlike Reinhardt. And yes, Arissa had a shield, and this meta of course would last for a long time. Even when it wasn't meta anymore, it was still being used. But then all of a sudden, out of nowhere at BlizzCon, they released an amazing new cinematic introducing Overwatch 2. Overwatch 2 was announced promising a PvE experience with things like talent trees for every hero, and they wanted to make it heavily replayable. So as they worked on Overwatch 2, they stopped releasing content for Overwatch for three years. Then, suddenly, Jeff Kaplan, the game director of Overwatch, sadly left the team. He was always a really cool guy, and Overwatch fans always held love in their heart for him. He was entertaining, funny, and just really wholesome. My name is Jeff. I'm one of the guys with the Overwatch team. I loved Jeff. However, I feel like some of the bad balancing of the game could have been because of him. <laughs> What the hell do you people <laughs> want? Do you just go play Mystery Heroes. And unfortunately, after that, in 2021, controversy started brewing. Blizzard was under lawsuits and claims that a lot of sexual harassment was going on in Blizzard, which did not help the game's reputation, especially when they stopped releasing content, which led to people boycotting Overwatch and other Blizzard games. Even the Overwatch hero, McCree, had his name changed to Cassidy due to the Blizzard employee he was named after being a part of the controversy. This controversy also affected the Overwatch League, making all the sponsors back out. A lot of time went by and we heard nothing from Blizzard regarding Overwatch 2. And we assumed they must be hard at work. The game was slowly dying and losing players since there was no new content, but people had hope. They said that the wait would be worth it when they got the PvE and the game updates that they promised. Despite the lack of new content near the end of Overwatch 1's life, the game actually became more balanced without the release of new heroes. At times it still sucked and you'd have to face awful team comps like Double Shield, but at least more things were playable again. The COVID pandemic may also have impacted the development of Overwatch 2 since employees had to work from home and then were forced back to work in the office near the end of the COVID pandemic, and many employees who did not live in the area were forced to quit. But it is uncertain to know how much this could have affected its development. And after the three year drought, the Overwatch 2 beta and Overwatch 2 finally released. In Overwatch 2, there was no longer two tanks, and the game was now 5v5 with one tank, two DPS, and two supports. Another approach they made in Overwatch 2 was rid the game of most crowd control abilities and stuns, which was actually really nice. However, Overwatch 2 came out without the PvE that was promised, and people were extremely upset, wondering what was the Overwatch team doing the past three years? Also, the game was now free to play, which was great for bringing in new players, but the monetization of the game became very extreme. Like if you want a hero skin in the show, 
shop, it's typically going to cost about 20 US dollars. However, the new Battle Pass costs about $10 and you can unlock various skins through this and even sometimes a good skin or two in the free Battle Pass, surprisingly enough. People really missed loot boxes from Overwatch 1, which sounds strange because most loot box systems were always terrible and greedy, but with Overwatch 1, if you played the game enough, you were able to pretty much get everything for free in the loot box system. The new Overwatch 2 competitive system also brought a lot more disappointment as well. People did not enjoy their rank being hidden until they completed a rank update, which was either after 7 wins or 20 losses, later reduced to 5 wins or 15 losses. Even new heroes were locked behind the battle pass. Either you had to level up far enough in the free battle pass to unlock the hero, or you could purchase the battle pass which would gain you access to them right away. And this is really bad for when certain heroes are necessary for the meta, such as Malga. Oftentimes, if you were playing tank against Malga and you didn't have him yourself, you would likely lose. Sojourn, the DPS hero released with Overwatch 2, was also pretty broken until finally balanced many, many nerfs and buffs later. Another thing they added to Overwatch 2 was roll passives. For the damage roll, specifically, after getting a kill, their reload and movement speed were increased by 25%, which made it pretty difficult to play support until it was later changed. Once removed, support became the dominating role with players upset that supports can be just as deadly as DPS with new heroes like Kiriko. Later, news was finally released for the PvE, though unfortunately, a lot of aspects that were promised for the PvE were announced to be scrapped. We've learned about what it takes to operate this game at the level that you deserve. It's clear that we, we can't deliver on that original vision for PvE that was shown in 2019. What that means is that we won't be delivering that dedicated hero mode with talent trees, long-term power progression. Uh, those things just aren't in our plans anymore players were furious. And when the PvE finally dropped with three missions, the cutscenes were great, however the gameplay was very much lacking, and people did not realize that the missions would come together for a price of 15 US dollars, a price that people thought would be free. And at the time of the PvE release, the game was also now available on Steam, and the reviews were, you know, you already know the story, Overwatch 2 became the worst reviewed game on Steam. And at this point, the reputation for the game was so bad, to this day I'm still reluctant telling people people that I play Overwatch. However, with Microsoft purchasing Activision Blizzard, the CEO, Bobby Kotick, of Blizzard finally left the company. So the Overwatch fan base was hoping that the game would change for the better without him. Many blame him for the source of greed of the monetization, as well as cancelling the PvE that we all wanted. And out of nowhere, we were told that Overwatch League was coming to an end. And we all knew this was happening because of all the bad decisions the higher-ups were making, such as the Overwatch League leaving Twitch for YouTube and etc. And also, people did not really care for it anymore. Anymore. People say Overwatch is a hard game to spectate because most people won't understand what's happening. Also, Blizzard wasn't making any profit off of it anymore, so it was always destined to go under. So with the Overwatch League ending, they promised Overwatch Esports will be back in the future in a different way. Soon after, Microsoft suddenly let a lot of Blizzard employees go, including employees from the lore and PvE side of Overwatch's team. So, as it seems, we likely won't be receiving any new PvE, as it was a financial and overall failure. However, on the good side of things, it seems like the Overwatch team is having more communication with its player base, and making promises to change things like the competitive system and the monetization for the better. And suddenly, a new Overwatch esports series was born, the Overwatch Champion Series. This was a way that anyone can sign up with their team and compete their way up the tournament ladder. They also brought Overwatch Esports back to Twitch, as well as it also being on YouTube. We'll have to see how well this continues to do in the future, but so far it's doing pretty well. Then, in-game, the competitive system has already been changed, similar to what we had in Overwatch 1, but to show more clarity on what's actually happening when you win or lose. So, no more rank updates after 5 wins or 15 losses, it's back to seeing exactly where your rank is and it being updated after every game. They also show you why why you would gain or lose more rank depending on certain factors, such as win or loss streaks and etc. And they also added a brand new rank, Champion, which so far not many people have reached, even months after the start of the season and all of these changes. And for another big and somewhat controversial change to the game was bringing up the HP for all heroes, as well as a new healing passive to all roles, and the new damage passive reducing the amount of healing targets would take when shot by a DPS hero. This brought back a lot of power to the damage roll and made supports not as powerful as before. The health increase to all heroes also made supports have less damage potential. This was to make the game feel less punishing and make being one shot less likely. They also tweaked some other things such as making hitboxes bigger so it's easier to land shots. 
This is a competitive game! And it has people debating whether these changes are good or not. A lot of people are just saying that they're dumbing down the game to make it easier for new players. So we've caught back up to present day, and we have yet to see whether the game's reputation can be saved. However, the game has been growing in player count. Now, there's also a new split in the community, and that is, should 6v6 be brought back? And even though the community is split on this, it's unlikely it'll ever happen. But I do miss the days of having a main tank and off tank work together. I still like Overwatch to this day, however, it's been around for 8 years, and I can't play and appreciate it as much as I used to. I miss the early days where the future looked bright, and I'll always be nostalgic for the good old days, but I'm sure we still have more to look forward to in the future. Even if we're burnt out from the game now, there still might be some fun later on. Thanks for watching.